When it comes to adventure platformer games, it seems only a select few really get remembered. A lot of these games get forgotten as time goes on, and that's not necessarily because they weren't good games. I mean, take Sphinx and the Cursed Mummy for instance, great game, yet nobody seems to really know about it. Amongst those games is a title called Kaya Dark Lineage, an adventure game published by Atari of all companies. They didn't even realize they were still around, then again, when did this come out? Uh, 2003. I guess they were still doing stuff back then. The game was developed by a company called Eden Games, the very same company that made that terrible Alone in the Dark reboot. And the V-Rally games, I guess, which, yeah, that's about it. Yeah, there's nothing really much else noteworthy under their belt. Ooh, doesn't look too promising, but you never know. Some of these companies actually do manage to pull that one hit out of their hat, and I mean, Eurocom did it with Sphinx and the Cursed Mummy, so let's see if Eden Games does it with Kaya, Dark Lineage. The story starts off with one of those lovely dated CG cutscenes, uh, Kai is alone in her room at night when she hears a strange noise from another room. She grabs a boomerang, of all things, and heads downstairs to check it out. Turns out that her half-brother Frank has found a hidden room in the house riddled with research and tools left over from one of Kai's father's strange experiments. By total accident, they then activate a portal that sucks them both into an alternate dimension, separating the two in the process. There are some nice subtleties in this cutscene, like how her dad's face is scribbled out in the family portrait, though you'd think she'd just crop it out and get a smaller frame if she really didn't like the guy, but whatever. Kaya wakes up in a strange new world inhabited by these weird furry dudes called natives, which is under attack by these wolf creatures. After one of them helps us escape, we're then taken to a village where we meet with Master Roshi. <laughs> He explains that their world is under attack by Kaya's evil father, who's been turning the natives into monsters called Wolfen, and using his Wolfen army, he's going to take over this alternate world. Supposedly, his end goal is to use his army to also take over Earth, even going to the lengths of creating a device that can even turn humans into Wolfen as well. It also turns out that they're holding Frank captive, and they plan on testing this new device on him. Kaya sets off to save her brother, agreeing to help the natives defeat her father in the process. To do this, Kaya will have to collect these runes that are scattered all across the world. It's a straightforward plot without any real twists or turns. What's left to make the story enjoyable is the characters, and they're really hit and miss at that. Kaya especially. I mean, she's a solid character, and her voice actress does a decent job most of the time, but she just says a lot of the lines completely wrong, like the actress didn't know the context the line was being said in. You must find our medallion. Your medallion? And what's with this part? I do know. You do? You got here the same way the other one did. The other one? Yes, Alan. Dad? Before the island blows up with you on it. Blows up? To the north. Second floor basement? Metal gear? Kaya has a much smaller move set than in most adventure games I've played. Your primary actions are just jumping and throwing your boomerang. Not really a whole lot outside of that. There's also a great emphasis on using bombs to solve puzzles and take out Wolfen. Instead of picking them up and throwing them like any other video game character, Kaya will instead kick them. There's also these little pudgy creature dudes that you'll also kick around. You'll need to get these from one area to the next so you can use them as a trampoline of sorts. The puzzle solving is definitely nothing out of this world, but it's still fun nonetheless. I I was a little surprised at the lack of a double jump, considering that most B-grade platformers just give you a double jump for the sake of making the developer's jobs easier when it comes to designing levels. Honestly though, not having a double jump to me shows confidence in obstacle course style level design. I know I've mentioned this before in some video, I don't remember which one, but think about it this way, what popular platformers don't have a double jump? Okay, now which ones do? Not to say that these are B-grade games, I'm using A-grade titles for this comparison. Okay, now tell me which games actually completely focus more so on actual platforming, exploration, and obstacle course navigation, rather than combat, stealth, or, you know, other mechanics. I think really good platforming games find ways of making jumping around your environment and navigating each obstacle course very interesting by adding wide movesets instead of adding just a double jump. Think about all the different kinds of jumps Mario can do, 
or all the different moves Banjo and Kazooie can do to get around their environment. But I'm getting way too off topic, I could make an entire video about this subject alone. Anyway, throwing a boomerang is your primary attack in this game for dealing with the small time baddies and for triggering mechanisms like switches and whatnot. You know, I never quite appreciated having two of these things in tie until I realized just how long it takes to cycle through a single boomerang to take out a swarm of spider things. I mean, you have to wait for it to return before you can throw it again every single time. It can make what should be a plow through a small group of enemies into something much slower and much less satisfying. Though you do unlock better boomerangs later in the game, that makes the job much faster, which solves this completely so you can't really complain. Now, combat with the wolfen plays drastically different. Instead of killing the wolfen, you'll just knock them out. You gotta remember that these are natives that were turned into monsters against their will. You'll have to cast a spell on them to turn them back after knocking them out. Doing so will use a finite amount of energy you'll gather called mana. Turning a wolfen back into a native can cost anywhere from 3 to 25 mana, depending on how big the wolfen is. You'll start the game with a cap of 50, but you'll be able to hold more and more with each rune you collect. Instead of using your boomerang to fight the wolfen, you'll use your bare fists. The game will slow down into a brawler with a combo-based fighting system. This mostly consists of just mashing either triangle or square while holding a direction on the control stick. There are real button combos you can learn and execute, but there's not much point in doing that since button mashing seems to be just as effective. I'm definitely not a fan of dedicated combat like this in platformers. Most of the time I find it falls flat on its face. <laughs> But I have dealt with worse. It is pretty slow paced, especially when the enemies decide to do nothing but block, bringing the game's pace to a complete slog, but it's at least satisfying to see those wolfen fly back in slow motion once you land the final blow. That is when the slow motion thing actually works, which it doesn't always. That's kind of a running theme in Kaya, when it works. When the game is working as intended, it can be pretty damn fun. But when it's not, it ranges from boring to downright frustrating. The platforming in this game is a great example of this. I mean, remember when I said games without double jumps often get inventive with your moveset or level design to create new and fun ways to navigate your environment? Kaya does, to an extent, succeed at this. There's a lot of playing with wind in this game, currents of air sending you flying up into the air, entering a skydive, or blasting you against a wall, having you sidle across, flinging yourself over obstacles. It's actually really cool, and that's a a very nice variety within the same context of the platforming genre. There's also these sliding segments which are very reminiscent of Rayman 2, though it does play a little differently. There's more pipe-like designs to the tracks. While it plays closer to Rayman, the level design itself is more comparable to the slides in Mario Galaxy 2, I guess? I don't know. It plays well and it is very fun. Of course, again, when it works. I'm primarily talking about the segments with wind blasting you against a wall. It's a great stage gimmick, don't get me wrong, but there are some parts that had me pulling my hair out in frustration. Jumps that are too easy to overshoot, jumps that you have such a small window of time to make, it creates these annoying difficulty spikes that broke up these moments of fun with moments of frustration. Another thing I found very annoying was running out of mana when turning Wolfen back into natives. I didn't really mention this, but every Wolfen turned back into a native is essentially the this game's stars or jiggies. If you want to progress through the game, you'll have to free a lot of these natives, and you need to do that to open certain shops that'll sell the items you need to advance. The problem is though, sometimes you'll find yourself with no mana, nowhere to replenish it, and lots of wolfen to turn into natives. Even worse, sometimes they even fall off the stage, and the only way to get them back up is to exit and re-enter the level and fight them again. If you encounter times like this, you'll have to do some hella backtracking to return to that area, and let me tell you, backtracking in this game is a pain. Kaya is a semi-linear game. Each level has a designated path forward that you're supposed to follow, but every now and then you'll have to revisit areas with newfound abilities to discover new areas. These abilities are often purchased at the village shops, like I mentioned before, but the way it's paced is really not good. Oftentimes you'll have the thing you can't do right in front of a warp point back to the village, so it's like, oh, I can't do this yet. Okay, you go 
back to the village, buy the item, and just re-enter the level in advance. It's as if the game's like, oh, you can't do this yet, and makes you backtrack to the village to buy the item you need. This is not how to build a sense of progression and discovery by obtaining new items. A good example of this is in Sphinx and the Cursed Mummy. You were given a very small open world that you quickly became familiar with, and each new item you found opened new paths that you had to discover on your own. Being spoon-fed these roadblocks that you have to go back to the village to open up is not a good way of doing this. It also doesn't help that the hub world with a native village is pretty forgettable. I've come back to this place dozens of times, and I could never quite get the place perfectly memorized. I think it's because it looks really samey, you know, they use the exact same model for every house and every shop, stuff like that. It's not like something like Delfino Plaza, where every house is its own thing, every street looks iconic, everything just kind of blends together here, and it's harder to navigate because of that. Coming back so often is a constant pace breaker, and I think the game could have benefited from a better way of introducing new moves and items into Kaya's skill set. Again, Sphinx and the Cursed Mummy did it really well. Look towards that game if you need an example of how to do it properly. Well, since we're talking about move sets, I may as well give some examples. The things you buy at the stores can range from better boards to slide on, like ones that let you use these boost pads, better boomerangs that you can throw much faster, as I mentioned before, but more importantly, things like gloves for climbing surfaces and a boomerang that can be remote controlled. The gameplay isn't the only thing that's hit and miss. The presentation is pretty bad for that too. Let's start with the good. The game looks pretty damn nice for 2003. Everything has the overgrown wilderness and dark fantasy vibe that it's aiming for. It actually really reminds me, again, of Rayman 2. The style, the textures, but mostly the dark clouds and the windy skyboxes. It screams Rayman 2 and I love it. On the other hand, the voice acting is very inconsistent. I mentioned before how Kaya's actress says some lines wrong, but that's just scratching the surface. The NPCs never have consistent voice actors. They'll greet you with one voice actor and then thank you for shopping with a completely different one. Welcome to our shop. Make your choice. You've made a great deal! <laughs> the game's got some questionable animations too, this lever pulling one for instance. Oh my god, Kaya doesn't waste any time at all when it comes to pulling switches. I mean, most games have this big, longer, drawn-out animation to, I don't know, build excitement or something, but Kaya's not having any of that. She goes up to that thing, she's like... One of my biggest problems with this game is definitely the camera. 90% of the time, it's A-OK, -okay, but there's always those areas every now and then where it just does not know what to do at all. And you'll find yourself getting dead. But if there's any one part of the game that I have to say I hate more than the rest of it, it's definitely this part right here. I was ready to pull the disc out and snap it in half. Okay, so there's this part here where you have to guide this Zeppelin thing down a long, narrow hall. You've got two buttons to stand on. One makes it go, one makes it stop. The idea is to get it to the end of the hall without any of these flames shooting out of these whole things to pop any of the balloons. Okay, sounds easy. It's not easy. There were also cutscenes placed in really weird places, just completely out of nowhere, like mid-gameplay, like I pull a lever, go up an elevator, and it just cuts to what the villain's doing. Okay, and then when it's done, I'm still in the elevator going up. I don't... I don't... These cutscenes also played without sound a lot. Maybe my disc is scratched? I don't know. I watched some of them on YouTube to check, and they did have sound there, so I don't know what's going on with my copy. Kaya's journey will take her across eight different levels. The objective of the game is more or less to get to the end of each one in search of the next one. Like I said, it's a semi-linear game. The non-linear part comes near the end, where you'll have to backtrack to unexplored areas in search of the remaining runes. Once you have all the runes, you can then unlock the final level and beat the game. It kind of reminds me of the final act in Whiplash, great game, lots of mindless destructive fun, but the final chapter turns into this confusing metroidvania that was really hard to navigate and really confusing and really not very fun. It's the same idea in Kaya, but it actually pulls it off much better here. The map in the game is much more legible, and the more frequent checkpoints you can warp to make finding the remaining runes pretty doable. Once you've got them all, you're ready for the final stage, and it is pretty damn challenging. A lot of boarding areas with lava all around. You. I found the final boss fight to be pretty disappointing. I was expecting it to play like the other large bosses, you know, having to dodge attacks, waiting for an opening, but this one just plays like a hand
hand-to-hand -hand fight with any other wolfen, and it boiled down to nothing much more than button mashing, much like every other fight in the game. Okay, I guess it's time for the, uh, the big dumb spoiler warning part of the video, even though I guess technically what I just said kind of was a spoiler. <laughs> Sorry, but I mean, do you really care about the story of Kaya, Dark Lineage? Do you, do you really care about the narrative here? I, I didn't think so. It's just that I, I have to talk about this game's ending. It is so dumb. I guess if you really don't want to see the game's ending for whatever reason, uh, skip right here. Um, otherwise, let's do it. So we beat Kaya's father, he falls into the lava, and he dies. Kaya doesn't even help him. I mean, she doesn't even hesitate not to help him. I even love how she tosses his helmet on in there with him. That is savage. Nice to see a character who doesn't hesitate to put the villain in his place, regardless of who he is to her. So Kaya, now reunited with her brother Frank, uses the runes to open a portal that's presumably going to be back home. However, Master Roshi comes along and warns them that the only person who knew how to consistently open the portal between desired worlds was their dad, and now that he's kind of freaking dead, they don't have his help, so there's no telling that they're actually going to end up back home. Kaya and Frank decide to take their chances anyway, because they don't really have any other options, and you know what? <laughs> they don't end up home. They end up in a desert wasteland, and... Huh? Wait, what just... what just... No. No, that's not how it ends. No, I didn't edit that. That's just how it ends. They get attacked by a thing, and it's like, the end? As if the hint at a sequel, I guess? Wow, another cliffhanger ending. You've got to be kidding me. The last game I reviewed, Sphinx and the Cursed Mummy, also had a cliffhanger ending. But the best part in this situation is Eden Games, the people who made this game... They don't exist no more, because when Atari filed for bankruptcy in 2012, they shut down Eden Games before Atari emerged from bankruptcy about a year later. The devs at Eden have since reopened as an independent studio in France, which is great on them. However, since they are now a separate entity no longer associated with Atari, I don't think they have the rights to Kaya anymore, and even if they did, I still highly doubt we would ever see a sequel to this game. And that's kind of a shame, because this game had loads of potential. I mean, it does fall flat on its face now and then, and does have a fair share of frustrating and tedious segments, but when it does work, it works pretty dang well. Most notably, the boarding segments and the segments involving wind. These were all great stage gimmicks that were taken advantage of to create some damn fine levels. If they were to further expand on these ideas while cutting the fat of the clunky combat and adding a much needed level of fine tuning and polish, we could have had a great sequel on our hands. It's definitely not a terrible game, but it can be a fairly unremarkable one. There are moments of brilliance, but they're in between what's either poorly executed or unexciting, and as such, I'd say it would be a fairly harmless venture to check this game out if you're really that interested in it. However, if you're looking for a really good adventure game, I'm not going to recommend this. I'm going to recommend something like Sphinx and the Cursed Mummy over it any day. Next time, we're going to be taking a look at a game called Haven, Call of the King, another PlayStation 2 platforming adventure game that met a very similar fate that these two have reviewed before it. So, tune in next time when we check out Haven, Call of the King. I'll see you guys then.